Hey folks, just a quick heads up that all episodes of the Film Nuts podcast contain heavy spoilers and some strong language. Nothing too crazy, but make sure there's no one with sensitive ears too close by. And if you like what you hear today, please consider becoming a patron of the show. You can find links to that page in the show notes, or you can visit patreon.com slash film nuts. Okay, anyway, please enjoy the show, and thank you so much for listening. I want you on Team Zissou. I don't think I can do that. Why not? Well, it's not my field. I don't have the background for it. No one here does. Klaus used to be a bus driver. Wolodarski was a high school substitute teacher. We're a pack of strays, don't you get it? See, I'm not even that strong a swimmer. The answer's yes. Well, it's got to be. I'll order you a red cap and a speedo. When he finally goes after something, it's not even real. You know, it's like, Mm -hmm. in trying to make this movie, how real is that as opposed to having a relationship with your actual son? in making this thing to be famous, to be known or something. So that's what I'm saying when I'm getting at this idea of reality and, mm-hmm. and what what is the most important things. Is it the things that we make that we'll be remembered by or is it just our friendship? Is it us recording this conversation or is it us having this conversation over coffee? Hey. Hi, I'm Taylor and welcome back to the Film Nuts podcast, a show about why we love what we watch. If you're a longtime fan of the show, you understand that our favorite movies and favorite TV shows have a way of inserting themselves into our everyday lives. We quote our favorite movies to our friends in normal conversation. We wear clothes we thought looked good on a specific character from our favorite TV show. And we even maybe watch stuff on our phones to keep us company during our daily train commute. There are even occasions when someone is so inspired by a film, they bring elements of it to life in the form of a tiki bar. The Ark Royal, located here in Raleigh, North Carolina, is a tiki bar infused with homages to Wes Anderson's The Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou. The decor, the cocktails, even a portrait of Bill Murray hanging behind the bar remind those familiar with the film of its impact on the founder of this establishment. That founder is Patrick Shanahan, an artist, filmmaker, restaurateur, and now friend of the show. Patrick was gracious enough to invite me and my camera crew down to see how he and the Ark Royal were inspired by The Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou. I love that movie more than just, oh, what's your favorite movie? Right. Like Wes Anderson's films have a way, I think, of becoming like a part of your daily life where like you're quoting it, you're wearing a red beanie, you're, you're handing out clocks. No, no, no. But seriously, it's like become such a big part of my life that I feel like Zisu has had an influence on the way that I actually speak to people and like mm-hmm. treat people and don't take myself too seriously in a way. Mm-hmm. This is a movie about making movies and we're going to make fun of movies at the same time. So and being a filmmaker, I like that. And, um, and now that I'm making less movies than I used to, I find it even funnier. So mm-hmm. like even moving into like bar creation, it was like, okay, yes, it's a tiki bar. Yes, it's a cocktail bar, but I don't want to take it too seriously. So let's take the spirit of that movie and the ridiculousness of Bill Murray's character and let's put that in the bar. You know what I mean? So it's not like you walk in and everything's blue, yellow, touch of red. That's Bartenders like, aren't wearing the red beanies. No, but they should be. Honestly, <laughs> this winter we might bring the red beanies in. You know, you you have the sharks on the wall for the jaguar shark. Yeah. You have like these like tribal elements, which is like a, a nod to like Pesha Spada Island and, and these like adventures that mm-hmm. I'm assuming Zisu went on. The first thing we ever did before we ever started like building anything was name the main three drinks, which are jaguar shark, the Belafonte, and the rum cannonball, because mm-hmm. all three are mentioned in the movie. Has anybody noticed that the Life Aquatic is in this bar? Yes. Many, many, many what, people. What do they, the, the cocktails, the, name, the, cocktail the names names. of the cocktails, they recognize they're, them. They're like, oh yeah, yeah, They're like, Jaguar Shark, Belafonte, like, what do you watch, Zisu? And I'm like, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've seen it. It's not and called Zisu, it's, it's, it's called the Life Aquatic. <laughs> what are we drinking? These are actually based off of Life Aquatic. This is our frozen drink. It's called the Belafonte, which was the ship. I knew our flagship drink had to be a frozen drink. You know, it's mm-hmm. like the one thing you come in, you're like, oh, it's got to be a shitty drink, but you try and you're like, damn, that's good. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a good drink. It is good. It is Very good. Delicious. People love it. They talk about it. It's no, you know what I mean? That's like a great drink. It's a great flagship. 
And then I knew because it's a tiki bar, rum was our focus. You know, right. rum is so unique. People talk about bourbons and whiskeys being so different and unique. Rums have complexities that the world has forgotten or has been washed over by the idea of spiced rum, which is ridiculous because this is a rum cannonball, which is a throwaway line in Life Aquatic. We love it, and it's all I drink when I come in here. What is I, it? What's in there? Today, we're drinking it with Clement Select Barrel Rum, okay. which is from Martinique. Um, and all rums are specific to the island which they come from, which comes from like an agricultural history of, unfortunately, uh, colonialism. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of these islands, you can trace back the way they make their rums to not only that island specifically, but also their colonizers. So you've got um, Spanish influences, British influences, French influences. And then usually when you use like a sweetener for an old fashioned, you would just throw in some simple sugar. syrup, yeah. sugar, sugar, as yeah. you will. But if you're making like a mezcal old fashioned, maybe someone throws in some agave mm -hmm. to keep it in the spirit of like the culture. Mm -hmm. And then here we're actually using falernum which is a clove-based spice, which you'll see in the tiki world a lot. Um, Falernum and orgeat, and uh, maybe you'll see like a passion fruit sweetener from time okay. to time. Uh, but those are the sweeteners you'll see in tiki. So tiki really is a whole different palette. Mm. It's very sweet. So you've got this like spicy clove coming through from the falernum. You've got tiki bitters instead of like an angostura, and then you've got um, that Martinique rum, which is like kind of sweet, but also has a punch. Not as much as like a high proof bourbon, mm -hmm. uh, which is what a lot of old fashioned drinkers like. They like a high proof so that like that ice melts and the sweetness like builds. And by the last drink, it's like sipping candy. Mm. But from the first sip, this one's kind of like candy. You don't have to be knowledgeable about tiki or other cocktail cultures to appreciate this place. It's fun, vibrant, and the drinks are well, delicious. <laughs> but the things that stand out to me are the connections between Tiki, the Life Aquatic, and Patrick's creative philosophy. So, after a few drinks and a lovely tour of the place, we sat down to chat about hospitality, the fabrication of reality, and not taking ourselves too seriously. So, here's Patrick Shanahan talking about the Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou on the Film Nuts podcast. Tiki itself is its own cocktail culture, right? Mm -hmm. It's its own thing. And I've been to so many amazing tiki bars that would just blow you away. Ones with like active volcanoes in them and stuff. Wow. You know, the grass skirt's incredible. There's just so many amazing bars. And these people are, like I said, it's a serious culture. When I approach tiki, there's one throwaway line mm. in Life Aquatic. You know, there's mm -hmm. one throwaway line that made me say, okay, it's enough for us to make it like that theme here, you know? What, if you, if what you, was it? <laughs> what a shame. They had a bartender here, Kino, made the best rum cannonball I've ever tasted. <laughs> it's not a real cocktail. I just thought that was really interesting, you know? And I was yeah. like, I want to follow that into the bar and, and show people how much I love Life Aquatic. Because if people wanted to say, oh, wh what's the Belafonte? Mm -hmm. What is the Jaguar? Or what's the point of all this stuff? Yeah. If you notice the little pieces around, people would say, maybe it has something to do with Life Aquatic. And if you know, you know. Because I feel like Wes Anderson himself is kind of that way. If you know his films, you know. And if you don't, well, mm -hmm. we don't have much to talk about. So why do you love this movie? You've just talked mm. about it's inspiring a tiki bar, but why do you love this movie so much? Well, I mean, I know this is a conversation, but I got to start with like the shortest. I'll make the story really short. You don't have to. I'm going to make it short. <laughs> I know it's more of a conversation, but this is a short story okay. and a true story. When I was in my, I think it was my junior year of high school, I was dating this girl. She's amazing, wonderful girl, beautiful girl. I haven't seen her in years, but she was great, Emily. Um, and uh, she lived out in Chapel Hill and I lived in Raleigh. So Durham was between us. So that okay. the closest AMC movie theater or whatever was oh, Durham. Oh yeah, South right? Point. South Point. Yeah. So I, I drove out and picked her up and she's like, let's go see a movie. I said, all right, let's see something funny. So Bill Murray had a movie coming mm -hmm. out. And I said, all right, I love Bill Murray. I love, you know, Ghostbusters and mm -hmm. Caddyshack, his fun stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. And so we go see this movie. And as soon as it started, I was like, this is not funny. <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> you know? I was like, this is weird. Well, that was only part one. It's a cliffhanger. Now I'm going to go hunt down that shark or whatever it is and hopefully kill it. I don't know how yet. Maybe dynamite. And we sat there and watched, and I was, like, so confused because I'd never seen filmmaking quite like that. And at the end of the movie, when it stopped, I looked at her and was like, what did you think about that? Mm -hmm. It's the worst movie I've ever seen. Wow. And I said, I think you may be right. <laughs> like, I think you're right. That was really bad. That was weird. 
So I go drop her off in Chapel Hill. I'm driving back, and all I can think about is this movie. I'm, like, so weirded out by it. And mm-hmm. I was really into film at the time. Mm-hmm. You know, I was seeing a lot of, like, uh, Kill Bill would come out kind of that same time, and I was, mm-hmm. like, obsessed with that stuff. Mm-hmm. Early 2000s. Yeah, yeah. Like, so I'm driving home, and The Late Show was coming. So I stopped back at the AMC Theater, and I went by myself. You went and saw it again? I went and saw it again. The same night? Same night. Wow. And when I left that movie, I realized that... Uh, I realized I needed to talk to her the next day, and I did, and, and I said, you and I are completely different people. We'll never make it, because that's the best movie I've ever seen in my life. And you're wrong. And I was like, I'm sorry. Like, great girl. Um, love her to death. Hope she's doing well wherever she is. But I knew that I I knew that we were fundamentally different people because she was wrong. I was just so taken by the film, because you're hit by so much visual in a Wes Anderson film. Mm-hmm. Was this your first Wes Anderson movie? No. You know, you remember like your parents would take you to Blockbuster when you're younger right. and like let you pick out one? Right. Did that happen with you? Yeah. Okay. So I picked out Rushmore a long time ago once okay. again because I saw Bill Murray. Uh-huh. And I thought like, okay, Bill Murray, this funny. is going to be funny. Yeah. And I remember watching it and I watched it so many times that weekend. I was, I still never understood like why Rushmore was speaking to me. No, it wasn't my first Wes Anderson film. I'd never seen Bottle Rocket, but I had seen Rushmore and I had seen World of Tannenbaums because mm-hmm. Tannenbaums is where he kind of came out. And mm-hmm. people, other than film people, started paying attention because mm-hmm. I think it got up for an Academy Award for some, probably best I screenplay, so, yeah. honestly. And everyone kept calling it a dark comedy. Mm-hmm. And everyone was like, oh, it's a dark comedy. And I was like, oh, it must be bad. It's dark mm-hmm. comedy. I didn't even know what it meant. I yeah, just remember. Meant, yeah. yeah, I didn't know. I didn't know. But now, then I knew because in 2000, whatever, I think it must have been three when I saw that movie, I was like, oh, this is something different. This is a piece of art. And that's what I want to do. Mm-hmm. You know, so I think that that's where it began for me. And then after that, I, the love grows, right? The first time you see it, mm-hmm. it doesn't make a lot of sense. The second time you see it, you understand the staccato rhythm of when, of Wes's like, mm-hmm. Wes, like I know this guy, Wes Anderson's, mm-hmm. uh, his writing style is like this weird rhythm to it. Mm-hmm. Where once you buy into the rhythm and you start to get the rhythm, you're like, okay, mm-hmm. I'm beyond that now. Yeah. And now I'm in this world. And now this is the world he's painting and he wants me to see. And now I'm into this moving painting. It's very different. I think he's very different than any other filmmaker that exists. Hmm. So when you're like, oh, I love what I remember this producer once said, like, I don't make and produce Wes Anderson films because I know I'm going to make money. I do it because I'm collecting art. Hmm. And I feel like that was the first time me being a painter. I was a visual artist at the time, like just figuring out painting mm-hmm. and, and bought my first little can and made, made some short films mm-hmm. in high school. It was like, oh, shit. Film is an art form. Now I get it. And that's why I love this movie. And it grows, it just grows on you, you know? It just grows on you. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm the same way. I actually, <laughs> it grows on you. I actually liked this movie the first time I saw it. Wow. Um, I guess I <laughs> I guess I was already understanding the humor because I saw Royal Tenenbaums and mm. that was like, that's like, it's obviously a comedy. Mm. It's, it's like you said, dark, it's kind of dark, it's dark comedy. Um, but I understood like the awkward comedy of it. I was like into it. And then knowing that uh, it was Life Aquatic would be similar to that and watching it and also having like, there was more of an emotional component. And then also like, I'm just like a big, like, like ocean wildlife nerd. And mm. so I was so fascinated. I was so taken with the fact that they were like inventing new species of things totally, and just how uh, beautifully they illustrated them with, with stop motion. I did, thought that was great. Did you know much about Jacques Cousteau? Yes. The first toy I remember playing with was like a Jacques Cousteau bathtub toy. Oh, okay. Well, cool. maybe I don't know if it was a bathtub toy. I played with it in the bathtub. Right, he yeah, was yeah. like diving in the tub <laughs> and he had little flippers yeah. and like a whole thing. And and I forgot about Cousteau, except for maybe a throwaway line in an Ace Ventura movie or something. I, you know, I, I don't remember. I didn't like keep up with him. But mm. you know what I love about the film is I I don't know if it, I don't know this for sure because I've no, this is just off the top of my head. Mm. I mean, I feel like reality television had become a thing. I don't remember when the writer's strike was, but right, reality television was, I feel like it was between Rushmore. Reality television was uh, yeah, around the turn of the century. I think it was between Rushmore and Life Aquatic. Uh, what was Rushmore? I, mean, I don't remember. But okay. Yeah, it, it happened between, right? So okay. uh, the Royal Tam Bombs. I feel like that. you should know this because I know you're a massive Survivor fan. I And that <laughs> came on. And that came on around like 2000 and 99, I want to say. Yes. I mean, I loved it in the beginning and then I would get so attached to these people that got voted off that like I just stopped. I didn't mm. get back into Survivor until recently. But there's a lot of tiki in. <laughs> if you watch Survivor, it's all tiki. It's tiki culture. They're, you're winning tiki idols and gods yeah, and stuff. Depending and on where they are. Yeah. They've, they've slowed that down. They have slowed <laughs> the tiki down because, you know, there's a whole thing about cultural appropriation. But we'll, yeah. well, I think we should t- touch on that at some point. But let's go back to reality for a second. <laughs> Documentaries are reality. It's reality. It's to a degree. Like this is yeah, real. Same, right? same vein. Yeah. So he, in the film, Wes, uh, sorry, uh, Bill Murray is a documentarian mm-hmm. making, 
making reality film. Mm -hmm. And he's creating these narratives throughout the movie, like with his son, mm -hmm. uh, with, with Esteban, with everybody. Mm -hmm. He's like, but you know, there's great scenes where it's like a touching scene. And he's like staring at his son and he goes, how are you shooting this Vikram? One, two, three. Attaboy, attaboy, here he is. Here he is, come on. You okay, Ned? You okay? All right, all right, give him some room. He's okay. He just drank a little too much water. How are you shooting this, Vikram wide open? Uh, light, five, six. He's so out of the reality. Yeah. He's just so interested in how it's coming off on the camera. Mm -hmm. So there's this idea that, yes, it's real, but none of it's real. And I'm, the reason I bring this up is because you were talking about the fake wildlife. Mm -hmm. It's like he wanted to show that the reality he's creating is so unreal that I have to make up these fake animals. Hmm. I, you know, these sea animals, sea creatures. Well, I mean, I... I, I to feed into I this idea. I didn't, I didn't take it as that. I took it as like the world we're witnessing is just like a mystical world where mm. we're gonna name, we're gonna have these animals that aren't real animals um, because like he he gets gifted the uh, the uh, crayon, crayon pony fish, crayon pony fish. Um, from uh, Klaus's son or grandson or yeah. nephew, nephew whatever it is. Steve, this is my little nephew Werner. He wanted to meet you. How you doing, Werner? He brought your present. A crayon pony fish. Wow. Interesting specimen. Thanks, Bill. You're welcome. I, I do love the idea of films inside films. I always have. Mm -hmm. uh, films about filmmakers. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of this movie I think is lost on people that don't know about film. Mm -hmm. How are you shooting this, Vicar? I'm wide open. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, hey, get a two shot. Mm -hmm. Get a cutaway of this miracle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like... The, the way that he speaks about it, I laugh now, but it's really not that funny. I think when most people watch it, they're like, this is not funny. This man is in despair. He's lost his father figure, Esteban, mm -hmm. and he's meeting this son that he's never had, and he's becoming a father figure, but he doesn't want to be. Yeah. And it's not that funny. It's dark. Mm -hmm. But the fun that movie gets funnier and funnier and funnier. The, the, he doesn't want you to be that attached to reality. Mm -hmm. So I, the more I thought about it the, over the years, seeing it maybe 500 times. To me, the fact that... Um Bill Murray is playing a documentarian and the fact that there is Owen Wilson plays his maybe, maybe not son. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're not quite sure to me, this film deals a lot with legacy, I guess, like both the, the struggle, uh, for what to leave behind and possibly the definition of it. So with all this, I mean, you're a filmmaker, you're a photographer, you're a screenwriter, you are a restaurateur with all the stuff that you're going on. What is, is, is there some kind of legacy that you're striving toward? Yeah, you know what I found about... I was just talking to our bartender, Brayden, who's here with us today. He'll, he's making our drinks. Cheers, Brayden. Shout out. <laughs> um, he, I was just talking to him about, what do you want? You know, he said, I want to own my own bar someday. And I said, mm -hmm. okay. I remember when I was 22, and I wanted to own my own bar someday. Mm -hmm. My legacy has become about hospitality. When, okay, let's start this back a little further. When I was in college is when I... I saw Life Aquatic in high school, got back to it in college. I'm going to answer this question, I promise. It's just a roundabout way of getting back to You can it. talk as much as you want. We're to. coming I'll, back. I'll just hold you to it. We're coming back to this <laughs> because this is important. I think because I, I try to like... I think about this a lot. Um, in college, if you came to my house, you were going... There was a lot of parties out there. There's a lot of like frat parties and all this stuff. And there's so many things to do in college. But I was painting at the time, and I wanted to sell my paintings, but I also wanted to go to parties, but I was so, like, anxious. I had so much social anxiety, and mm. I didn't want to leave my house, so I just had these, like, art parties. Mm. And people started coming, and they bought my paintings. But we would wow. party all night long. Mm. And these were, like, wild, fun times where I was, like, painting all over the place, and, like, bands would play. And this went on from 19 to 23 I lived in that house, so you know, four years of this, like all the mm -hmm. time, constantly people knew about it. It became a thing. We would have this tiny little house, 1500 square feet full of 400 people. You mm -hmm. know, it was just a wild time. Wow. If you came to that house during that time, life aquatic was on. Mm. It never came off. That TV never turned off and it played life aquatic from the, from the, it was always on. I never stopped. It just <laughs> kept going on repeat that criterion collection. Yes. That's I, the exact yes, one I have. Yeah. Just kept on and kept on and kept on and kept on and kept on. So if you were in that house, you saw bits, some bit of life aquatic going. Mm. And so Life Aquatic became a really important part. But then when I went to New York to film school and started drinking differently, it wasn't like, oh, Jack and Cokes. It wasn't like, you know, I drank some absinthe in college and thought it was cool. And then, right, I, right. and then I went to New York and was like, oh, there's a different way of drinking. You don't have to drink in excess. 
you can drink one or two and have a really great night and mm -hmm. really enjoy what you're learning about the story and like where it comes from. And that's what I love about tiki and craft cocktails like I do is there's a great story way be that goes way beyond my involvement mm -hmm. of really talented people, like really exploring a craft. And, and so I find the art in cocktails that I started to respect. So when I came back and always had this idea for Watson Ward, my first bar, it became about hospitality, right? It became about, I want people to have a great experience here. Mm. And, and my approach to bar making was like my approach to filmmaking, which I, you know, still working at that. But, you know, I always say that if you have a really good cast, like approach bars, like I approach film. So if you have a good cast, that's like your bartenders, your bar backs, you know, your, your, your door guys, like everybody is so important. Mm -hmm. What is the story from the moment you walk into my bar to the moment you leave? The first person, and the last person is the doorman. Mm. door guy door girl whatever door they mm -hmm. that is the most important person i treat them and let them know you are important you are everything you're not just the person sitting at the door you are hey how's it going how are you doing tonight mm -hmm. you are the first impression and you're the last impression mm -hmm. hospitality has to be about how you treat somebody and i've always strove like when i met somebody i always want to listen to them and talk to them about what are your interests what are you into you know i feel like the art of caring was really, I mean, I think it's kind of back now. <laughs> it must hmm. be hip to be caring. Um, but it, I felt like it was Isn't that shitty. I know it's so <laughs> freaking weird, but I felt like it was really important to get to know people even. Hmm. And I love this to strangers like today that I meet. I still do this just not because I'm thinking about it because I'm interested. I am. I want I love talking to strangers about mm -hmm. strange things and what, what they're interested in. What are they doing? How's their day going? Whatever. Yeah. But hospitality, I think is, is the legacy I'd like to leave behind is like, I always felt like when I was with Patrick, you know, I'm talking to myself about myself in third person here. <laughs> when I was with Patrick, he felt like I, I felt like I was heard and listened to and seen. And I feel like when people come to Watson Ward, you're, you're seen and you're felt and you're heard and we want to be there for you. And if you come to the Ark Royal where we are now, my second venture, it was always who's the cast, what's the lighting, what's the story. Mm -hmm. And so if I can continue to create these, these moments, like I see this, like we're sitting in as a continuation of my art from college as a continuation of storytelling, uh, screenwriting, filmmaking. When you go into a space that I've designed, do you feel a certain way? I, I can control the way you feel mm -hmm. from the moment you walk in the door and then, and then your experience is your own. So like the first time I sat back in one of my bars and I watched people, man, dude, I was hooked. Mm -hmm. I was hooked. It's cool to like sit in a movie theater and watch people like, Oh, <laughs> when something you wrote and they're laughing about it, mm -hmm. like, oh, it landed. Mm -hmm. But imagine getting to see that movie like 500 times in one night mm -hmm. and people are experiencing the room we're sitting in, the taboo room, mm -hmm. people like fighting to get in, people freaking having sex back here and getting thrown out. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Not that we condone that. But well, that, that's why you kicked them out. Yeah, we had to throw them out. They didn't get that far. Uh, but I'm just saying what happens in the taboo room stays here. Uh, but I think that if that's what filmmaking is, an art is, is trying to allow someone to see what you want and then how does it affect them and what does that play between in the mind is a very complex thing. But it's also very simple. And, it's, and I was telling Brayden, the bartender, if you want to make your own bar, find the right cast. Make sure the lighting is exactly what you want it to be. And mm -hmm. what is your story? There's a lot of bars that come and go and people are like, oh, you know, opening a restaurant, a bar is really tough. Well, the ones that make it have great stories. Mm -hmm. Where does this chef come from? Where did this bartender come from? What makes this space interesting? What mm -hmm. makes that interesting? What, what makes this different, right? Mm -hmm. It's all in story, whether it's a painting, whether it's a screenplay, a film, or this bar, mm -hmm. it all begins with story. So if hopefully, I find that the older I get the that my art will be forgotten. I have to say, I mean, I'm not the best artist, right? My art will be forgotten. I, I, it doesn't matter. I mean, how many paintings can you name off the top of your head? Probably some Van Goghs, a few Monets. You go to the MoMA or whatever, you see this collection of great art, right? But think about the Egyptians. Like they were putting out some serious art that has all been stolen and taken around the world to different museums and stuff. But they, I don't think they were thinking about like, oh, someday I'm going to be famous, right? Mm. But now everyone wants to be an artist because they think they can they can skip having to get a job. Everyone's mm. a photographer. Everyone's a filmmaker. Mm. Everyone's an artist, whatever. Do you think... Sorry, I'm just rambling. No, 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 no. The rambling is welcome. Do you think that people, everybody wants to be an artist or does everybody want recognition for something? Mm. I mean... I don't want to say, does everybody want to be famous? But like... Hmm. Not to be all get off my lawn about it, but I do feel like that there is a, 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 a certain age group coming up that um, including our own generation sometimes about like just wanting to be known. That's a good way of putting it. Um, or be seen. Even, be, even if it's coming from a place of I just want to be seen, 
and that gets construed as to wanting to be known or something. No, I, I love what your thoughts are. I mean, I think these are things that we're dealing with every day and thinking about all the time as artists, like, and separating ourselves because it's so accessible to be an artist and to be seen right now. Mm-hmm. You can do whatever you want to be seen. Yeah. I mean, we see this in he- terrible ways. Mm-hmm. People that aren't seen and aren't heard, and aren't, mm-hmm. aren't understood that are, I don't want to get dark, but, you know, no. shootings and shit that we see every day. It's horrible. But when you see these people that are, like, marginalized and they have no other way to be seen. Mm-hmm. And then you have people that can flaunt different talents or attributes to Mm -hmm. be seen. You know, I mean, there's always really good things that people are doing. People are standing up to say, like, I want to be an individual and stand up for the environment or for rights or whatever, whatever they want to do. Mm -hmm. I think there's more platforms now Mm -hmm. to be seen and heard. But it's not always a good thing. It can be dangerous and it could be good. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that, yes, people want to find. I think people don't want to feel so alone, Mm -hmm. you know, but but when I was when I was painting earlier in life, I remember in college and high school. No, 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 no. Let's go back, 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 back. When I was a kid, I really loved star Wars. I watched a lot of star Wars. I really loved that nerdy world of like, Oh, this is fantasy. Right. Mm -hmm. I was kind of the nerdy kid that wanted to draw. Right. Mm -hmm. But then someone saw a drawing of mine in second grade of these two ducks. Mm -hmm. I hate these ducks. They're still, they stay, they haunt my life. They changed (laughs) my entire trajectory of everything I ever did. Oh man, these better be great ducks. They all send you a pic. I mean, I'll, I'll get you one. I mean, they're out there. My mom copied them. So like, she has the original, like three, two grand for, yeah, I know. I'll get you. I'll get you. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, so these ducks, they were like, I guess they were just better than the rest of the kids. And they're like, this kid's got a little bit of artistic talent. And finally I wasn't just another kid in school, which Mm -hmm. I didn't really care. I was in second grade when this happened. Right. I became, I was never the fastest. I, ne- I rarely finished the mile. Remember you had to run the mile? Mm-hmm. I was like a three lap guy and it was a four mm-hmm. lap mile. I'd be like, yeah, I did my mile. And they're like, no dude, Patrick, you did three <laughs> laps. You better keep going. I was like, eh, I just, I tap out. Just give me a 10 minute, whatever, I'm out. Mm-hmm. Um, I wasn't fast. I wasn't athletic. I wasn't any of these things, but I could draw. And it got a lot of recognition. Mm-hmm. I was really noticed, you know, in school. I like really noticed. And then I started singing in plays. And gave me more recognition. I was like, oh, I'm like known as the one artsy kid at this small school. That's Mm -hmm. cool. That was my thing, you know. So I think getting recognized for something Mm -hmm. is important. Do you think that is... But I don't think that's a lasting legacy is what I'm getting at. That's all right. I don't mean to cut you off. No, no, no. I have found that I've been surrounded by such talented people in my life that I've tapped out of art. Because I saw someone, Sean Richards, painted a painting once. And I was like, if I could be as best, if I could be the best I would ever get. And I, you know, to know your limitations, I think is important. I will never get better than that. Mm. And that's what I want to do. And he's doing it better than I'll ever do it. So why keep going on? Mm. So I said, okay, let me retain. What can I do? Where where can I go? What is really calling to me? Mm -hmm. And I seem to have gone, I still enjoy screen. I literally love writing, but I do find that the idea of legacy living to live beyond to be remembered or cared about years from now mm-hmm. is the most vain, arbitrary thing that anyone can go down. So I really try to find out how can I be remembered from this moment to maybe affect you, to affect what I've taken from this mm-hmm. and move forward in the rest of my day and the rest of my week and the rest of my month to be a better, to be a better version of myself. Mm-hmm. I'm interested in my legacy while I'm alive. And I think that if you live that way, the maybe the one or two generations that will remember any of us after this will care about that. You know, I think we have to, we have to continuously push each other towards like something to get better. We, I don't think I can make the world better by one thing I'm going to do, but if more of us keep being more something more Mm -hmm. together, more like open, more welcoming, maybe that makes a longer lasting thing than anything I could make. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I, I, so, I understand. so I think that's to bring a hel- this back, healthy way, that's a healthy way of thinking it, I think. Yeah, yeah, to bring it back to bars, even though it's around drinking and we're selling poison, don't let me kid you. <laughs> um, I'm a drug dealer at this point. <laughs> um, I think that I've seen people get married and engaged, break up, fight. I've seen people punch each other in bars. You know, I've seen them like make out in bars. I've seen them literally get engaged, like start their lives together in my bars. And it's cool to like create the set, mm. but not write the movie. Mm-hmm. And then you get to watch it write itself every night. So that, think, so that's my legacy. I think I that's say. a good. Uh, that's so that's the the inverse, the antithesis of uh, Steve Zissou's <laughs> motivations mm. um, when it comes to stuff like that. I I think that brought it back. One of the things that really hits me with the movie because we both agree it's funny. It might might not be um, understood by other mm. people, but we both think it's funny. But uh, when they do finally get up to the jaguar shark, it's one of the like emotional, big emotional beats of the movie. Are we 
we, are we safe in here? I doubt it. You still want to blow them up? No. We're out of dynamite anyway. It is beautiful, Steve. Yeah, it's pretty good, isn't it? I wonder if it remembers me. What to you does the jaguar shark, what is it a metaphor for, do you think? Mm. If anything. The jaguar shark, like I was saying in, about reality, in making anything, let's say in Steve Zissou making a documentary about this, mm -hmm. what's his motivation? Revenge. Yeah. <laughs> Which is amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's so good. It's, that was so, it's like it's a great so start. I know. It's oh, incredible. I'm going to interrupt you with a quick contact. Yeah, fact. please. Quick. So that, um, the, the film festival scenes uh, was filmed in an opera house, the oldest opera house uh, in Italy, in wow. Naples. I've been there. Wow. And I had no idea. I was listening to the director's commentary and they told me where it was. I was like, I, I, I've seen um, Madame Butterfly wow. in that. In I'm, that opera house. I'm rarely jealous. You, you've got me on that one. Damn. It was it was very hot because there's no AC in that entire place. <laughs> Those scenes, and they're all sweating. Yes. In the scene. Um, very that, authentic. <laughs> that intro, by the way, is so odd. Like It's so great, though. That loses 90% of the people that don't understand it. It happens in the first 10 minutes. Well, I just don't think they got it. It's like, what's yeah. with this rhythm? Why is this bird lady speaking so weird? <laughs> it's just bizarre. That, that whole intro just throws me. And he loves doing that throw a four, three ratio in there. Mm. He did it with the velvet curtains. It's like right, a four, yeah. three documentary, you know? Yeah. Uh, Cause I guess they're shooting on 16 millimeter at the time. But what I'll say about reality is he's chasing this idea that this imaginary creature killed his father figure or best friend, whatever you want to say. Steve Zissou has nothing. Steve Zissou is a joke, right? He's got no family. His wife doesn't like him. His crew doesn't take him seriously, except for Klaus. Mm. So he's kind of a man on his own. And all he has left is to try to save his career, is to create this false reality, to search for this shark. And he's going to blow it up with dynamite. I think that... Because everybody's doubting. They're like, they don't think the shark is real. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, of course. I think that it's, a, it's the grasp, a desperate man's grasp, last grasp, for something real. Mm. But we know... The Jaguar shark is not real. He made it up. Wes Anderson made it up. So we are all chasing something to feel something real. Well, that well that, that's outside that of idea. it, though. That's outside of it, though, because all the creatures in the movie are made up. Like, they are fictional. Totally. But within the reality, the Jaguar shark is real. No, I agree. But I'm saying I think that Wes, I think Wes Anderson is taking it a deeper step mm. to, a, to say... All this stuff is not real. Mm, okay. The reality so is the, not real. So there's a deeper meaning behind the fact that he's created. 100%. I understand And saying. I don't know if people talk about that. Mm. I thought about this not that long ago because someone asked me about one of our cocktails, which is named the Jaguar Shark. Mm -hmm. um, it's a mezcal drink. It's delicious. Um, but someone was talking about it and I was like, you know, it's not even real. He just made all that stuff up. Like the cramp pony fish, the Jaguar Shark, the... The red snapper, you know what it is like? The fluorescent the snapper. Fluorescent sna Thank you. The fluorescent snapper. What do yeah. you say about any movie, though? Is made up? Well, no, because in, um, not necessarily. Let's talk about Jurassic Park. <laughs> There's actually a T-Rex in real life. There was a T-Rex. No, that's right. But I'm saying the, the if, if we're talking about individual organisms, mm. like, yeah, there is a difference. But I think the, what, do you think because uh, Wes Anderson and Noam Baumbach went into a deeper level of making up a world within a world that they're commenting on the fact that a world that that world is made up, right? Realities are made up. One hundred percent. I understand. I, understand I think these men are extremely intelligent. Oh, yeah. A lot of times in film school, they'd be like, the filmmaker did this because he was he was trying to do this. And I was mm -hmm. like, no way. My my answer to that would be I was like, how do you fucking know? <laughs> You're not wrong. Wes Anderson is one of those people that is just so unfortunately intelligent. Mm. Intelligence plus money to make a movie is a disaster for incredible. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Give me some money. I'd love to go make a film. It's time. But I do think that Wes Anderson has been allowed to create a palette beyond any other filmmaker out there. And I think that's why his work is so 
unique. They're, like you can say like, oh, I love. Ta- Let's just go with the most obvious, mm-hmm. Tarantino. Mm-hmm. I love Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, but it's very. There's similarities, but it's very visually different from. The visual differences between that and any of his other work are so different. Mm. Even though you can say, oh, he does the two shot in the car. Oh, he does these tracking shots. He does the, this and that and this and that. Sure, mm-hmm. we can go all day long. Wes Anderson's films look so different, but it's the same damn film. Yeah. It's like the same shots, you know, like over mm-hmm. and over. Like his tropes are beyond any. You have so many Wes Anderson tropes. Mm-hmm. So I just think that um, he's all of his worlds are so like play like and there's plays even Rushmore has a play within the play mm. you know what I'm talking about the um where he's like uh oh uh, what Rushmore's I know, I know, great I know. He, he the kid puts on a play that's pretty much like a rip of apocalypse now where oh, he like okay. brings in a helicopter and <laughs> it's ridiculous you got to see that movie but Wes Anderson's always dealing with that and also in Tannenbaum's you've seen Tannenbaum's mm-hmm. she's putting on plays where he's like, right, yeah. what, what is this, That's a bunch right. of characters? Yeah. <laughs> what characters? It's just a bunch of kids in costumes. <laughs> like, one of the best lines of all time. Um, he's always interested in creating false realities within realities. And I think that meta is a thing now, but, mm-hmm. I mean, I think he was ahead of his time, mm-hmm. ahead of his game. And people won't, I don't think, even though there's, like, a hipster culture that respects Wes Anderson now, I don't think he'll really get his due until he's gone. Mm. So, what's your favorite moment or scene from this film? Mm. You know, just the one that jumps off my head because I haven't given this much thought is the one where he comes up and he goes, I forget exactly what he says, but he's like, hey, Steve Zissou. Uh, it's um, uh, Owen Wilson comes up to him on the okay. boat. Yeah. I don't know if it's true or not, by the way. Uh, do you? No, I don't. I haven't heard from her in 30 years. I guess it's too late now. She never contacted me, you know. Yes, I see. You're supposed to be my son, right? I don't know. But I did want to meet you, just in case. I appreciate that. I'll be right back. Don't go away. And um, Life on Mars, but it's played by Sue George. Yeah. Kicks in and he walks to the front and he goes up and lights a joint, smokes it. And then as he's coming down, it like slows down, mm-hmm. ramp down in time, which I don't know if Anderson's ever done that in any other film. That's a choice. Mm-hmm. A very strange choice, I've always thought. I don't know if him and Yeoman got into it over that or if that was just like planned. I have no idea. But I think it's weird that they ramped the speed there mm-hmm. to draw the... Is that like, oh, I'm high now, so I'm getting slow? I don't know. That's weird. That's not something he usually does. That's a weird visual um, choice. And then he's like, oh, sorry about that. You cut me with one foot off the merry-go-round. I just think it's such a ridiculous moment. Instead of dealing with the moment, he escapes. Mm-hmm. And that's what he's been doing his whole life, I, th- I believe. is like escaping the realities that are there. And then when he finally goes after something, it's not even real. You know, it's like mm-hmm. in trying to make this movie, how real is that as opposed to having a relationship with your actual son? in making this thing to be famous, to be known or something. So that's what I'm saying when I'm getting at this idea of reality and, mm-hmm. and what, what is the most important things? Is it the things that we make that we'll be remembered by, or is it just our friendship? Is it us recording this conversation or is it us having this conversation over coffee, mm-hmm. which is more important? Yeah. I don't know. I'm finding in life that I am less um, upset about the paintings I don't paint and less upset about the movies I don't make and more interested in the relationships I have every day. That's good. No, that's really good. I think. Uh, if you had to describe this movie um, to someone who had not seen it, to try and get them to watch it, what would you say? Man, I have done this so many times. You <laughs> so know, what's your pitch? Oh, uh, you know, it's like the whole film. Um, <laughs> so you just tell them the whole movie? <laughs> I, no, you know, I pretty much say, dude, have you seen Live Aquatic? No. Oh, my God, man. It's this amazing film where Bill Murray is this, like, oceanographer documentarian. And he's just so just full of despair and like self-loathing and like at the end of his rope and he's just no one likes him. And he's so down and and beaten down and and like trodden on. And and then, you know, on the eve of like this failed premiere Mm. is a strange son that he didn't know even had approaches and Mm. says, you're my father. And I think from there, what you see is just unreal. You see Owen Wilson and. And uh, Bill Murray really delivering such an amazing performance, supported by an incredible ensemble cast. Mm-hmm. Um, 
it's just the most ridiculous thing that I can't even explain because it's hard to explain the complexities of this film. It's just not, it's just not like anything else. Even today I was on a, I was on a zoom call with some guys from LA's theater screenwriter guy and this producer, and they've made some pretty big films, pretty good films. And he said, uh, I said, I was always going on this podcast to talk about my favorite movies. So what's that? And I said, life aquatic. He goes, Oh man, I don't know if we can be friends anymore. Oh. <laughs> You know, and I'm the writer of their movie. And it's like, okay, well, we didn't get into it in the moment. I really do like this guy. We have very different styles, but we're mm-hmm. kind of, he's coming on to work on the script with me a little bit. And um, it's it's hard to get people to understand. If you don't, you don't. And I've honestly talked about it so many times that I, if you don't get it, I'm not going to explain it to you. Mm. And I'm not, I don't really want to talk about it. It's it. tiring sometimes. It's exhausting. Yeah. It's exhausting. And also my my girlfriend of five years, she's never gotten through it. Wow. Does, does, could, I, which is funny because of the story how we began <laughs> of the girl that like I walked away from. But at this point, that's the, how different I am as a human being. It's yeah. like, if this doesn't speak to you, I don't need my entertainment to appease you. Um, my, my partner fell yeah. asleep watching it doesn't and, and woke me. up after Owen Wilson died. And she goes, wait, what happened to Owen Wilson? Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, I, you know, it's funny. I don't think I don't. Oh, I hate saying this. I don't think Owen Wilson had to die to, for that film to have an impact. Yeah. I, I thought that I mean, was a weird decision. Yeah, it was interesting. I, but the, I rewatching it. I was like, Oh, I actually love the scene that he died in which he dies. It's amazing. I think it's so incredible. Are you okay? Hey, I'm okay. What happened? Did we hit something? Most likely not. Hey, maybe the push rod failed. I'm sorry, Ned. I should have scrapped this chopper 10 years ago. You know, maybe I should have auto-rotated and performed a high bank through our descent. We might have crashed a little softer. As the camera is hovering right at the waterline, every time the water fluctuates right in front of the lens it gets redder and redder and redder and it's just like it's like sad and gorgeous at the same time so sad i feel like i really connect with that guy i felt that i the look that bill murray gives you in his eyes i felt that way at age 17 in that theater watching it Mm. i felt that old and sad and tired about being a painter Mm. doing being an artist being a human being I was exhausted in high school. I felt so misunderstood and like even through college, even now to a degree, I mean, I've given up on people caring what people think, but I mean, there was a time where I was so exhausted by other people's approval and being so different than what my family wanted me to be. And I think that life, that scene where he died, I was, I felt like him and I felt so connected to him. The second time I saw it, the first time I was just mm-hmm. like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> And the second time I saw it, I was like, man, I feel like I am Bill Murray in this movie. Mm-hmm. Like I was when when Ned dies, I was like, this is devastating. And mm-hmm. I, I wanted it for him. I wanted him to win. Mm-hmm. I wanted him to win. Yeah. And it's weird that they like, OK, so like if we think about it for a second, Werner, mm-hmm. like what's the future of this? I always think about that. Like, what's the future of movies after? Does anyone else think about that? Like what's going mm-hmm. I kind of some movies get me so excited. I'm like, I want to watch more of these characters do this thing. Mm hmm. I want to watch more of Life Aquatic. Like, does Werner become the surrogate son? Like, is that why he exists in this film? Because mm-hmm. there is youth that does like him and does care about him, mm-hmm. even though it's not his son. Like, he, it's too late for him to have the real relationship with his own son. But then also the girl, Kate Blanchett's character. Mm-hmm. Um, Jane. <laughs> yeah, Jane Covey. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like, is her son going to look up to Zisu? You know, like, what, what was it? what were they doing throwing in all these babies and fathers and sons? It's like, there's a lot happening right now. If you had to come up with another drink for the Ark Royal based off of life aquatic, what would it be? Grand pony fish. Ooh, but, what, what is it? I don't have it yet. And I'm going to be honest with Man, you. Come on. I know I'm going to be honest with you. This is why I don't have it. Obviously we know where the Ram rum cannonball came from, but my idea was calling it the rum cannonball number one, two, three. And mm. every time we change it, I never want that drink name to go away. So we just changed the number. Mm. I think we're on number four or five now. Mm-hmm. And then uh, this is the Belafonte. Still number one. I just assumed it would change because mm-hmm. I just kept the number because I never wanted those to leave. And then the third one was the the Jaguar Shark, which I knew I wanted a Mezcal drink because I'm just a Mezcal fiend. And I was like, no, well, we'll do something with Mezcal. And the fourth one was always the Cramponi Fish. But I like the Belafonte and I like the Jaguar Shark and I like the Rum Cannonball. 
But I knew that when we figured out the cramboning fish, I better fucking love it. No oh, one I soon. No one I've ever maybe met. Soon. No one. I'm not. I'm not the cocktail geniuses, right? I'm the, <laughs> I'm the guy that can drink something and tell you if I like it. Mm-hmm. Can I create it? No, not yet. No, I mean, I'm not trying to be that guy. You know, like when I you, think when you do come up with the idea, guy. though, it should come in a plastic bag. One <laughs> fucking thousand percent. <laughs> Oh my God, what a great idea. I'm not, I'm, I'm with that a hundred percent. Awesome. But we have to make it absorbently expensive so that no one really orders it or else right. we have to Do put it in, put in, a, in the goldfish bag. bag yeah, the goldfish bag. And that's exactly. how it, that's how it should be garnished is with like a little something <laughs> in the bag, you yeah. know, and you have to pop a hole, you know, and drink that's it. That's fun. But I love that idea. But I think that the most important thing is that when I watch Life Aquatic, I have fun. Once I got, awesome. once you get past like the darkness of it yeah. and you realize that the sadness is the funny part, mm-hmm. like how sad Sisu is, yeah. becomes so funny because he's so ridiculous. Yeah. Tiki is fun. Tiki culture is just, a, it, it was the antithesis of cocktails. Cocktails became so pretentious on their comeback mm-hmm. in like the 2000s, like coming out of New York and LA and wherever they were being rebirthed, the, mm-hmm. the craft cocktail. Oh, you don't know what bourbon you're drinking? It was like mm-hmm. some, such bullshit. Mm-hmm. Tiki is fun. It is a revolution of cocktails. It's been going on since the thirties. People are into it. It's fun. There's, I just had a pineapple fall out of my drink. You know what I mean? It's like, (laughs) where are you going to find that? In Tiki. Like enjoy your life, have fun, watch good movies, drink good drinks, have good loves, have good friends. Who cares about the rest? Legacy doesn't matter. I think that's the perfect point on which to end. This has been great, man. Yeah. Fantastic. I I can't thank you enough for having us over here. It's been awesome. It's been great, man. In the taboo room. I know. This is fantastic. We'll, we'll keep it safe in here. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to, well, I'll have a little bit left. Yeah, I'll cheers. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, I was right, like, I can't go. cheers with him. No, I appreciate that. Thanks, man. This has been awesome. I'm a big fan of the Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou. I also really like visiting the Ark Royal, and Patrick and I have known each other for over a decade. But my greatest joy from recording this very special episode was that I got to make something cool with people I care about. Finding ways to combine community with creation and care is something I'm valuing more and more lately. I can be inspired to write a short film or produce a documentary or make a very special episode of a podcast, but I cannot do it alone. So the biggest of shout outs to everyone who has made this episode happen. My crew, Keaton Lusk, Chris Newman, Keishan Ganatra, Roland Delorier, and Kira Morera, our bartenders at the Ark Royal, Carell and Braden, Patrick, of course, for being so gracious with his space and time, our patrons for inspiring me to be adventurous and creative, and all of the watchers and listeners across six continents for supporting the show just by hitting play. If you enjoyed what you heard today, and I sincerely hope you did, please go ahead and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform of choice to stay up to date on all episodes of the Film Nuts podcast. If you happen to be listening on Apple Podcasts, go ahead and leave a rating and review. That helps us get noticed by more awesome people just like yourself. If you want to support the Film Nuts podcast on Patreon, check out the show notes for that link or visit patreon.com slash film nuts. Our theme this season is brought to us by The Deep End. Our artwork is designed by Madonna. And all episodes of the Film Nuts podcast are produced and edited by me, Taylor D. Adams. If you want to get in touch, you can email filmnutspodcast at gmail.com or follow us on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter at Film Nuts Podcast. And don't forget to join the Nuthouse Discord community absolutely free by checking out the link in the show notes. Thank you all so much for listening to and hopefully watching our mid-season finale of the Film Nuts podcast. I really hope you enjoyed it. We're taking a few months off, but we'll be back before you know it. And until then, please, please, please take care because life is an